It was, oh. Oh,
You know what? Oh, perfect. Just unplug it. How's that? Perfect. I apologize, sir. All right, we'll get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Robertson. I'm the Somerset County Prosecutor. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. Um, I know we're also live streaming this, so I hope we have a captive audience. Um, I want to thank the Hunterdon County Prosecutor's Office as well for participating in this. Mike Williams, the acting Hunterdon County Prosecutor, couldn't be here. Um, but uh, so today's presentation um, is going to be about sexual assaults on campuses. and. Um, we're honored today to have the Attorney General Gabriel Gruwal, who's a good friend of mine, um, and he's going to give some opening remarks. But I want to emphasize that this is a very key topic for us as prosecutors. Um, this is an educational facility, and we want to make sure we provide you with the most safe environment. But likewise, unfortunately, there are instances that may occur, um, such as the instances that we'll talk about today. And we want to make sure that you are educated, no pun intended since we're at a community college, we want to make sure that you're educated on what to do and the resources available should you be a victim of something of this nature. Um, and so I would encourage you after the presentations or during them to ask any questions, feel comfortable. Um, we have our assistant prosecutors here, both in Hunter and Somerset County, that prosecute and investigate these crimes, as well as our detective, detectives rather. So um, again, I want you to feel comfortable and feel free to ask any questions. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our Attorney General, Kabir Graywall. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to join all of you this afternoon for a few minutes uh, to talk about today's topic. Uh, before I do that, I want to thank my good friend, Mike Robertson and Mike Williams, the Somerset County Prosecutor and the Hunterdon County Prosecutor's Office, for helping organize this event. And I want to thank Raritan Valley Community College for hosting this event. Uh, I became Attorney General last January, and one of the first things that I did was establish something that we call the 2121 Project. That's 21 counties, 21st century policing. And the goal behind that project was to get our prosecutors in their communities to talk about issues of importance to the community and to bring law enforcement and community together to have open conversations. Last year, we talked about a number of issues, a different issue each quarter, so about 84 community meetings. We talked about bias crimes, we talked about immigration issues, we talked about elder fraud, we talked about juvenile justice issues. And then this year, as we were thinking about the curriculum, the topics to talk about uh, across the state, we could think of no more important topic than the one being discussed today, which is campus sexual assault. And I know it might be a triggering topic for some folks, and some of the discussion might evoke feelings, uh, and you know there are people here who are here to help you if that's the case, but, but I do think it's an important topic that we need to engage on. On the way here, uh, I was reading uh, the, the latest campus uh, climate survey, which revealed that 25% of female college students across this country have experienced some form of sexual assault. And when you talk about sexual harassment, the numbers are even higher. And so we've taken a lead on this issue at the Attorney General's office, and we've done that in a number of ways. One of the things that we've done is push back against this administration and the Department of Education in Washington, which is in the process of changing Title IX rules, on changing definitions of sexual harassment, and changing on how those cases should be investigated, and changing the processes that apply to those types of investigations on campuses across this country. We think those changes are not positive. Those rules have not been changed since 1975, and they should be improved, but not in the direction that this administration is taking those rules. 
So back in January, I led a coalition of 19 attorneys general to push back and submit comments on those changes in Title IX rules. And it's my hope that the comments we submitted, along with other actions being taken across this country by other, other organizations who are really trying to highlight the shortcomings of those rules, will result in good rulemaking. And if the rulemaking is not what we expect it to be, we'll push back against whatever rules the Department of Education intends to roll out on this topic. But we also realize that pushing back alone can't be how we address the issue of campus sexual assault. So we're pushing forward, too. And we're pushing forward our own vision in New Jersey and how we could create a supportive environment for victims to come forward and report crimes and to feel comfortable engaging with law enforcement to not feel that their complaints will go unheard or that it's not worth complaining because nothing will happen. We have to change that culture. And so we revised rules in New Jersey. We updated the guidelines that apply to all of our prosecutors across the state on how to investigate allegations of sexual assault, period. Those rules had not been updated in 15 years. And we changed those guidelines to create a more victim-centered and more supportive approach. And not just guidelines. We made those guidelines binding on all of our county prosecutors and all law enforcement agencies in this state on how to approach victims, how to collect evidence, how to talk to victims about their rights. And so that's a key element of what you'll hear about today, about our new approach in this state on how we're going to deal with victims. The other thing we did at our office, you know, I have the privilege of leading an office of nearly 8,000 individuals. 8,000 public servants across 13 divisions who work in our Department of Law and Public Safety. And all 13 of our divisions touch on victim issues in different ways. But we realized we weren't doing a good job in coordinating those efforts. So we're also undertaking a top-to-bottom review of how we could become better at addressing the concerns of victims. And we brought in someone to help us in that review to better use our victim uh, aid monies that we get from the federal government and other grants that we have to, to help build that culture that I'm talking about where we could be supportive to victims of not just sexual assault but of any crime. And the final piece of what we're doing to push forward our vision of, of what a, a supportive law enforcement community looks like on what a, a model of good policy is for the investigation of these types of crimes and of sexual harassment as well is holding these community listening sessions. Going back to that 2121, prosecutors are doing this all across our state to hear from each of you about your concerns on how we can do better to inform you of your rights, to inform you of processes, to talk to you about how things are investigated and what your rights are, and, and if you want to change your mind at a future date, what your options are. And I think those type of dialogues produce good policy because we don't profess to get it right every time. And it's, a, it's an evolving process, it's an iterative process, so those guidelines will get updated again as we hear from more victims from across the state, from more survivors from across the state on how we could do better. But it's not just sexual assault. We also realize that sexual harassment that might not rise to the level of a criminal sexual assault is also pervasive. As I mentioned, that campus climate survey, 65% or so of, of Females on campus experience some form of sexual harassment. And we know those numbers are high in places of public accommodation and, and workplaces across the state. So one of the other things that we are doing as we speak is through the Division on Civil Rights, which is one of the 13 divisions that I'm responsible for, is to finally use the tools that we have there to promote rules and guidance for places of employment and public accommodation on how we deal with allegations of sexual harassment, how we investigate them, and how we could remedy situations or cultures where it might be broken. And we will start to use that power that we have in our Division on Civil Rights to issue this type of guidance. And we've been having hearings across our state, public hearings, to hear from survivors, to hear from stakeholders, to hear from community activists, to hear from anyone who wants to speak to us about this topic. And, and it's my hope that with all these efforts to include what we're doing here today, that we can get to a place in this state where no one, no one, regardless of the crime, regardless of, of whether they're a student or not, ever says or thinks that it's not worth it to go report something to a local law enforcement officer. And so that's my hope for this program. That's my hope for 
the engagement that we're undertaking across our state. And it's my hope that you learn something from the county prosecutor's offices, that you develop relationships, and that you give us your feedback on where we can do better. You have a great college here, and their Title IX coordinators work diligently to make sure that they are doing everything possible to create a safe and supportive learning environment. But we could all do better, and that's what this is about. So thank you so much for having me this afternoon. I want to thank Mike, and I want to thank the prosecutor's office and all the assistant prosecutors who are here and all the detectives who are here for lending their time. And I really hope we have a productive discussion. Thanks. Thank you, General. Um, in addition to the detectives and prosecutors, you know, we also have our victim witness advocates here as well, which they play an instrumental role in not only my office, but any office in this state. So I want to thank them for being here. Um, so with that, we will start the presentation. And I believe Hunter and County is up first. Do you want the mic or that? No, thank you. I'm good. Right. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Linda Fabiano. I am a detective sergeant in the prosecutor's office in Hunterdon County. Um, I've been there for 19 years. Primarily, I've worked in the Special Victims Unit. Prior to going to Hunterdon, I actually worked in the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office uh, for 12 years, and primarily uh, the same thing, the Special Victims Unit. So I'm just going to do a very... Uh, broad and sort of brief overview of, of what I do in the unit, um, but starting with this. So the messages that we generally get from um, our parents growing up are things, you know, watch, you know, your drinks if you're out, don't leave your water unattended, or know who your friends are, don't, you know, take drugs, use drugs, um, don't talk to strangers, um, among, among other messages. Um, and here's why our parents and our grandparents and our aunts and uncles tried to teach us all of these things. And that is because one in nine girls under the age of 18 and one in 53 boys under the age of 18 are sexually assaulted. Um, and those are staggering numbers. Um, and it shouldn't be one in nine. It should be zero in nine and or zero in 53. But that's what our parents were trying to teach us. Um, so, but now, you know, you're grown up, you're in college, um, but the message is still the same. Our parents, our loved ones, our friends, you know, we're all still trying to get that same message out. And in college, um, somewhere between 19 and 27 percent of women and 6 and 8 percent of men are sexually assault, assaulted on a college campus. Um, and that's basically one in five women and one in 16 men. Again, very staggering numbers um, if you think about it, if you put it into perspective. Part of the issues that, that I have found in the 31 years that I have been doing this is sometimes there's a lack of understanding with regards to consent. Um, it's not always clear yes or no. It's not always white or black. Sometimes there's gray areas there. Um, and the, the issue is that consent is not given once and then assumed for the rest of the time that you're with someone or you know someone. And you can consent one time for into a sexual relationship, um, but that doesn't mean the next time you see that person you have the same feelings. That doesn't mean that that's a blanket consent. And I think that sometimes that's, a, that's a, a definition that is lost on people. No matter uh, what age you are, whether you're you know, adults in your 30s, 40s, 50s, whether you're 15 year old, you know, 20 year old, it's, consent is, a, is, an, is, a, is an issue sometimes. And um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a maybe. It's never a maybe. Uh, if you have to talk someone into having a sexual relationship with you, there's probably a consent issue there, right? Because, you know, talking someone or persuading someone into having a sexual relationship with you could mean, you know, that they feel bullied or intimidated or now they're not sure that they can say no. So consent is always uh, an issue. And, and I could go on for another hour about that. 
But on college campuses, more than 90% of sexual assaults or sexual harassment or sexual contact is not reported. And I think the big question is why? Why is it not reported? Um, is it not reported because uh, people don't know what services are available to them? Is it not reported because people don't know the process of reporting? Is it not reported because they're worried about um, the shame or the stigma of reporting it? I think that there's a lot of reasons why that it's not reported. Um, but as the general said, I think it's important that we get to the point where we feel comfortable coming forward and reporting and that there's not a stigma attached to it or there's no shaming attached to it. Well, why, why were you at that party drinking? Or, you know, we have, to, we have to get over all of those social stigmas and those social issues to the point where we are comfortable reporting when something bad happens to us, whether it's a sexual assault or something else. So the process, the process of reporting for, for my office, for Hunterdon County, it comes from many different ways. It could be reported to law enforcement. Uh, it could be reported to campus security. Um, sometimes it's reported via a medical center or emergency room. It could be reported via uh, like a women's services like Safe in Hunterdon and whatever their, uh, their part is in Somerset County. It comes from many different ways. If it's a juvenile, oftentimes it comes through DCPNP, which is formerly known as DIFUS. A lot of people know it as DIFUS. Um, so we, we get them from um, many different areas. But however the report comes in, generally what happens is, so for me, I'm the sergeant in our unit, Special Victims Unit. Um, there are four other detectives in my unit and, and a lieutenant, my supervisor. And when, when a report comes in, depending upon where it comes from, it's assigned to one of the detectives. And there is, there's a very long process uh, that, that we go through. Um, and a number of things can happen. The, we could reach out to the victim, take a statement from the victim, a formal statement. Uh, we reach out to any witnesses. <coughs> We would reach out to anyone that, that you might have told, because a lot of times we confide in our best friends, right? We don't want to tell anyone else, but we tend to tell our best friends. Well, sometimes our best friends, they're very important in the investigation because it just lends to um, credibility. It adds cooperation to your story. So we will meet with your best friend or whoever you told. Um, we eventually will meet with the the suspect or the person that you know has been accused of um, sexually assaulting you or touching you in an inappropriate way. Sometimes there are medical examinations. Um, sometimes not. It, it depends on the facts of the investigation and what we uncover. So there's, it's it can be a very involved investigation. Um, and again, and I won't, you know, sort of bore you with all of it. But there's there's a lot of uh, steps involved in it. But once the investigation is complete, the facts that we have learned from the case are then presented to an assistant prosecutor in our office. And uh, we have an assistant prosecutor specifically assigned to the Special Victims Unit, and she's been um, an assistant prosecutor in our Special Victims Unit for a long time, so she has a lot of experience. And so we run the facts of the case by the assistant prosecutor, and then a decision is made whether or not charges are warranted against this individual, we refer to them as a suspect, against this suspect or not. If for some reason um, charges are not warranted or, uh, you know, there, there can be many things that go right in an investigation, quite honestly, and many things that go wrong. Um, and often through no fault of the victim or the, or the witnesses, um, but there are just sometimes things that don't go right. In the event that no charges are um, authorized, then generally the assistant prosecutor and someone from our victim witness unit, who you'll hear from um, in, from Hundred End soon, or a detective from my office will sit down with the victim and explain the entirety of the investigation, everyone that we talked to, everything that they said, and, and the reasons why we're unable to proceed. In the event that um, charges are authorized, the same thing. We sit down with the victim, we explain to them 
what charges are being authorized. Um, and then as a result of that, there are many services that come along uh, once, once an individual has been charged. And again, Victim Witness uh, is going to talk to you about that. Um, but in Hunterdon County, uh, there, are, there are enumerated offenses um, that fall into a category where we have the ability to apply for a sexual offense restraining order. It's called a SORA. Um, and in Hunterdon County, if you're charged with any one of those enumerated offenses, offenses and I, there's probably 16 or so, maybe 12, um, we always file on behalf of the victim a sexual offense restraining order. And basically what that is, is it is a protection for the victim in which the suspect is put on notice that he is no, or she, is no longer allowed to have any contact with the victim, whether it be by phone, by text, via Snapchat, you know, um, via mail, via third party, you know, have you know, go to his friend or her friend and say, you know, please tell them I'm sorry, I love them. <clears throat> no contact whatsoever, no carrier pigeon contact, nothing. Um, and that is something that we do as a matter of course here in Hunterdon. And it's just, it's an added protection and an added sort of safety um, that, that we want the victim to feel. Um, oops. This is the SORA, the Sexual Defense Restraining Order. Um, and as I said, we generally, there are other types of restraining orders, uh, domestic violence related restraining orders, but in Hunterdon County, if it's a sexual offense, um, we on behalf of the victim go to the judge and have the sexual offense restraining order filed. Um, so I, I think my 10 minutes is probably close to being up. Up here is my information, my office number, my cell number, and my email address. Um, please feel free if you have any questions. It doesn't matter if you're from Somerset or Warren, wherever it is, if you have any questions, any concerns, um, you know, if you're not sure about something and you want to, you know, bounce something off me, please feel free to uh, reach out and contact me. So next is Holly Hoff. She's our Victim Witness Coordinator. Okay. Yeah, it's right. up there, Dave. Well, we'll figure, we're trying to figure that out. Um, my name is Holly Hoff, and I am the Victim Witness Coordinator um, in Hunterdon County. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so I just want to let you know that many years ago, um, I used to be a student here. So it's kind of nice to be back to Raritan Valley in this capacity and to be able to share with you um, what I do. Um, I've been in, this, in the Victim Witness Unit for 12 years and I'm very um, passionate about this job. Um, and the main point of Victim Witness is helping people. So what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today is what we do in the Victim Witness Unit, what our services are. Um, literally, we are a support for the victims. Nobody asks to be a victim of a crime. They come in, you know, they've either been um, sexually assaulted or, or perhaps they're a victim of domestic violence or perhaps they're a victim of theft. And the victims come to us and they are very confused. There is this obviously in a very emotional time in their lives. They are probably coming to us at one of the worst times in their lives. So they don't know what they're walking into. They don't understand the terminology. They don't understand, you know, what's a pre-indictment conference? What does grand jury mean? So we're literally helping them through the criminal justice process. We're explaining the process to them. Sometimes we're literally holding their hand as we go through this process. We're their support. Um, we notify them about their cases. What's going on with their specific case? Um, has their case been um, set for, for trial? Has their case, um, does it have a court date? Um, what's the plea recommendation? So we're letting them know what's going on with their case, step by step. Um, the other thing we're doing is, you know, as advocates, we're not counselors. Okay, so that's important to note. We're not counselors, so we have to make referrals to 
other agencies for, for uh, victims to go and get services. So sometimes people are in need of counseling or um, you know, specific services. So we will help them find those people that they can go to, that they're comfortable with, to be able to you know, help them through this difficult time. Um, we'll also send them to different agencies that um, you know, that they might be able to get compensation for. Perhaps they're, um, you know, any, any kind of crime victim, maybe there's some medical expenses that they might need to um, be reimbursed for, or perhaps counseling expenses, or um, anything like that. We're able to refer them to those specific agencies to help them um, find, you know, get reimbursement. Um, it looks like we're still, uh, I'm gonna try. Okay. Well, if it comes back on, you can see what's, what's written. Um, the other thing, too, uh, that we do um, is we provide separate uh, victim witness waiting area. Um, in Hunterdon County now, we're very um, pleased to um, have a specific victim witness waiting area available to victims. They don't have to sit in the hallway when that defendant is, is around. Um, you know, they can be in the courtroom, um, you know, sometimes with the defendant, but if they don't feel comfortable being in the courtroom, we can have them sit in a waiting area, we can bring them in when the time comes. So it works out really well that we have the separate area for them so they don't have to be around this person the whole time they're there. Um, again, courtroom accompaniment. Um, we go to court with victims. We sit next to them the whole time. This way they feel that they're not alone, they have somebody there, who understands the process, and sometimes too in, in sexual assault situations, you know, they might not want family members there and hearing the things that happen. So for some people, they take comfort in having a third party there, um, able to, uh, you know, doesn't know them, doesn't know anything about them, um, you know, can kind of help them walk through the process without, you know, those painful details being, being um, told to their family members. Um, the other thing we do is provide transportation. Sometimes victims don't have transportation. Um, you know, they might either they live out of county, they don't have a car. Um, even if they live in county, um, you know, if there's transportation issues, we will help with that. Um, we also, if their property was stolen, um, you know, if their home was burglarized and some jewelry was stolen, um, we will help them with return <coughs> evidence um, to make sure that once the case is over that they get all of those things back to them. Um, again, we help victims um, write a victim impact statement, which is the, one of the most important ways that a victim is heard. Most of the process is the victims talking through us. So we're taking the information from the victim, we're passing that along on to, the, to the assistant prosecutor or the detective. But a victim impact statement is very important because that's the time where either a victim can write or they can speak in person how this has harmed them, how this crime either has physically, emotionally, or financially harmed them. So it's really the best way to get their point across, to get their voice heard instead of speaking through us. Um, and sometimes victim impact statements can be so powerful. I've seen amazing victim impact statements over the years. Um, so we really encourage victims to write them and we help them with that. Um, some of the other things that we're doing is trying to get reimbursement for restitution. So again, in a, let's just take a burglary situation. Um, some things might not have been recovered. There might be jewelry and other items that weren't recovered. Um, or perhaps there are medical expenses that somebody might have incurred. And if for some reason they can't you know, collect that through a state agency, then we can ask the defendant to pay that back to them. So that's something that we're helping them with. We're helping them collect all their receipts or getting those numbers and passing that along to the assistant prosecutor. Um, we also get involved with their employer if need be. If, if they need to be in court with us, you know, we can write them a, a real simple note and just letting them know um, to give to their employer, letting them know that they're needed in court for, um, you know, we don't go into any details, we're very general, but that, that they're needed for a specific day. Um, we've helped victims with assistance in obtaining HIV and AIDS test results of a defendant. 
um, referral information in regards to medical testing and counseling, and notification of a defendant's release. Um, if somebody has been um, you know, put in jail and they want to know when that person's going to be released, especially in a domestic violence or a sexual assault situation. Um, so we will notify that victim uh, you know, via phone that person's being released. So as you can see here, we really are, are, are very supportive of victims. We try to make them as comfortable as possible in a very uncomfortable situation. We don't want them walking through this, this scary criminal justice process alone. And it is amazing. When I see victims come to me from the very beginning, some of them are very broken. They're upset, obviously. They, you know, they're extremely emotional. But the strength that they gain from day one to day whatever it is, is amazing. And I have to say, that's what truly makes my job so rewarding, is to see them gain that strength that they might not have ever known they have. So it really is quite um, an amazing process. And I just want to finish this um, presentation with a quick summary of us as advocates. So I'm going to read this. As an advocate, we are here to listen, not to judge. We are here to help people discover what they are feeling, not to make feelings go away. We are here to help people identify their options, not to decide for them what they should do. We are here to discuss steps with people, not to take the steps for them. We are here to help people discover their own strength, not to rescue them and leave them still vulnerable. We are here to help people discover how they can help themselves, not to take responsibility for them. We are here to help people to learn to choose, not to make it necessary for them to make difficult choices. We are here to provide support for change and ease them into their new normal. So. I know we're going to do questions at the end. Here is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me. As Linda said, you don't have to be from Hunterdon County. If you have any questions, please reach out anytime. And of course, if you have questions at the end, we'll be here as well, and I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brianna Dembick. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, I've been with Safe in Hunterdon for a little over four years now. Safe in Hunterdon is a dual agency in Hunterdon County, and by dual, I mean a domestic violence and sexual violence agency. Uh, I am a senior counselor, um, adult senior counselor at Safe in Hunterdon, and we adult services provides individual, group financial empowerment, and case management. Um, so with individual counseling, um, I am the individual counselor for uh, sexual violence survivors. Uh, if the process is that they, um, our SART team gets activated, I am the person that will call them for a phone screening, do the intake, and individual counseling with them if that's what they choose. So I will be that person. Uh, and we also have um, amazing counselors on our team, four other counselors, two of which are senior counselors. So another process that you could um, access our services as for 100 and county residents is if to call um, and you know, inquire about services. And we are more than happy to provide any information that you guys would like. We also have uh, group counseling, so in addition to individual, um, I run a group as well. I'm on the fourth cycle of HOPE group, so our HOPE group is honoring one, one's personal experiences, and it really focuses on um, healing, and this is regardless of the trauma, so it can be sexual violence or domestic violence. Um, it focuses on resiliency, coping, and self-care, because I find that those things are so incredibly important through the healing process. Uh, we utilize creative arts, um, such as music, drawing, collaging, and yoga, and, and many, many others. As you know, I try to seek um, different ways to you know, help, help the survivors. 
So our financial empowerment program, that can help with um, budgeting, it can help with housing and guiding them um, you know, around the services that I'm not aware about. So that's why we send them over to our financial empowerment um, provider there. And they also help with um, increasing credit as well. So she does many things. We also provide case management services. And um, that can include um, needing help with obtaining insurance or navigating social services amongst many other things. Um, we all work together as a team, so if um, those, all those services are needed and of course wanted by the survivor, uh, they can have all of those services, all four services, all at the same time. Um, in addition to those services, we have our safe house, which is um, a safe location if housing is needed, um, if you need to escape a situation that you don't feel safe in. And then lastly, we have our legal services, which Don will speak more about. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dawn Solari. I'm an attorney with Safe in Hunterdon. Um, however, I am a retired assistant Hunterdon County prosecutor for just shy of 30 years, actually, and I worked with these folks here uh, for many years in the, it's okay, in the Special oh, Victims Unit. For oh, okay. Or this one here. Um, so I retired uh, about four years ago from the prosecutor's office, and then I quickly went to work for Safe and Hunterdon, where I am an attorney there. My title is Counsel for Victim Services, and uh, we have a separate um, part of our agency is uh, legal advocacy and legal representation. So we have, besides myself, there's another attorney on staff at Safe and Hunterdon, and we help with general legal advocacy, and we also um, help with actual representation of what we call plaintiffs, but victims in, uh, who obtain temporary restraining orders, and ultimately if they want to obtain a final restraining order. So we help with that. We actually have, it's, it's a bit unusual in the state that you have attorneys on staff in your domestic violence, sexual violence agencies. Um, but as Brianna mentioned, in Hunterdon, it's a dual agency. In Somerset, I know you have your separate agencies, some of which you'll, you'll hear from today. So Somerset has a separate domestic violence and sexual violence. And in Hunterdon, we have both under one roof at SAFE in Hunterdon. Um, so we have, um, what we do is we accompany folks to court. Um, Thursdays are final restraining order hearings. So we accompany people to obtain temporary restraining orders, and then we go with them to court for our entire calendar, our final restraining order calendar. We have our advocates and our attorneys there every Thursday to meet with hopefully every plaintiff that is on the calendar. Um, if we have the opportunity to speak to them ahead of time and perhaps assist them in obtaining their temporary a restraining order and then we're there for them at court for their final restraining order hearing. Um, as I said, I might represent some of the plaintiffs. My colleague Susan is an attorney with our office, also might represent them. We also have two other agencies that help us with representation for our plaintiffs. We have legal services. We have an office in Hunterdon County, and uh, one of the main attorneys there helps with representing our, uh, the plaintiffs for free. And of course, as Brianna mentioned, all of our services are free, including representation. So myself or Susan, who might represent them. Legal services represents folks that are low income. There is a financial criteria for that. And we also have a group of pro bono attorneys that are family court expert attorneys who are part of our group called Haven, 100 Attorneys for Victims Empowerment, Empowerment Network. I never remember the whole thing, but it's Haven for short, H-A-V-E-N. And there's a group of, we have a group of about 20 attorneys, both in mainly Hunterdon, but also Somerset County and some of the other counties that are on call every week to represent our plaintiffs at our final restraining order hearings. Um, so we do that. Um, as I indicated, um, we help with getting the TROs, 
helping them with the final restraining order, if that's what they want to do, getting them through that court process. And they may also have accompanying criminal charges, so um, since I have that background as well, I can help or I can um, you know, speak to people in the prosecutor's office. So it's great that I have that background and I know all these wonderful people in the prosecutor's office because they may have three or four different court proceedings going at the same time. Um, and that's overwhelming, as you can imagine. Uh, what judge do I go to? What court? Do I need an attorney or not? Um, all of those types of questions. Um, so we help with all of that as well. Um, we also, besides, uh, it's funny, people say domestic violence and sexual violence. Sexual violence or sexual offenses is part of the umbrella of domestic violence. So it's funny that people use two different terms because, as you will see, in one of the handouts out back there is the 19 offenses under our law in New Jersey that are considered domestic violence offenses. And a few of them are sexual offenses. So it falls under the umbrella of domestic violence, but also um, it could be separate either for criminal or also for another type of uh, restraining order. Besides a temporary restraining order and a final, which are only for domestic violence victims under our law, and that's specifically defined, but basically it is, um, you have to be the adult, the plaintiff and the defendant have to be 18 or over, they have to be adults, except the victim can be less than 18 if they are emancipated, if they are pregnant um, with the child of the defendant, or if it's in a dating situation. So that's very important. You can be a domestic violence victim or receive a temporary or final restraining order if you're in a dating relationship, even if you're less than 18 years old. Okay? And the other important part of the domestic violence victim is if you presently or formerly lived with someone. You could be a domestic violence victim. So you could be a roommate in a college situation, a co-tenant, a family member, anything like that. Present or former household member would fall under that. So if you fall outside of that definition, you could also obtain what's called, uh, Linda mentioned sorrow, but we also have in New Jersey uh, a sexual assault protection order, both temporary and final. And those are for folks that if, if you haven't perhaps uh, gone to the police and you don't have to go to the police for these, um, or if there aren't criminal charges for whatever reason, or if the criminal charges are over or the sentence is over, you might want to apply for a sexual assault protection order. And those are for folks that are specifically not domestic violence victims, but for sex, uh, victims of sexual offenses who want a protection order. Um, the sorrow is much easier, and if there's criminal charges, we work with our prosecutor's office and they usually get them first because it's important because for a sorrow, the victim doesn't have to testify in court. But for a sexual assault protection order, they do. So, but for whatever reason, if you didn't report it or you don't want to report it or after the criminal case is over, because restraining orders, final, and sexual assault restraining orders, final ones, are forever in New Jersey. They aren't dismissed unless the victim wants them to be dismissed, okay, and it's up to the victim. Um, we have some handouts back there, so I just wanted to point out, please feel free to take some. We have some brochures from SAFE, um, both legal advocacy brochure and our general brochure. We have a little uh, card about consent that Linda was talking about and that Brianna deals with all the time. So that's uh, for date rape and college campus situations. Uh, there's the list of the 19 DV offenses. There's a handout about the sexual assault protection order back there, a little bullet point about that. We have some post-its and then we have these handy dandy pens that have a little pullout that talks about SAFE and our phone number and our information and our hotline. We have a 24-hour hotline as well. So uh, remember, we always talk to our victims about um, there's a certain time in the relationship that it's the most dangerous time. And that is when you are starting to exert your power and control. Because domestic violence is all about, and sexual violence, all about power and control, right? So when you start to exercise your power and control by going to the police or getting a restraining order or getting a sexual assault order, uh, maybe breaking off the relationship, leaving, moving out, 
filing for a divorce or separation, separating from the person. That could be, and often is, the most dangerous time in the relationship. So that's why we want you to know about our services, know about our police, know about our domestic violence and sexual violence services, so that you can avail yourself of that. So we have all those handouts out there. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'll hand it over to the next person. My name is Ariana Cohen, and I am from the Sexual Assault Support Services, also referred to as SAS, at Zufa Health, which is located in Somerville. Before we get started, I just wanted to get into a couple of statistics when it comes to sexual assault, just so we can kind of see the scope of it. One in five women and one in 16 men are sexually assaulted while in college. More than 90% of sexual assault victims on college campuses do not report the assault. College freshmen and sophomore women appear to be at a greater risk of being victims of sexual assault than upperclassmen. 84% of the women who reported sexual coercive experiences experienced the incident during their first four semesters on campus. Transgender college students are vulnerable to sexual violence as well, with 21% of transgender, genderqueer, and gender nonconforming college students having been sexually assaulted. Here's a little bit more about sexual assault support services at SAS. We are one of the designated rape crisis centers in New Jersey. There are 21 all together. We have been around since 1988. We were formerly known as the Women's Health and Counseling, and right now we are housed out of Zufa Health, which merged back in 2014. Here are a couple of services that we provide. So we have a 24-7 sexual assault hotline. It's done by our trained advocates, and they're available 24-7 as well as our staff, which usually takes the calls Monday through Friday from 8 to 6 p.m. Anyone who calls the hotline it is confidential and anonymous, so they don't have to give their name um, or their age. We also do crisis counseling on that hotline as well, too. When it comes to anyone who wants to seek formal counseling, we can do crisis counseling, short term, long term, and it's all done by licensed clinicians. Um, we give that service to survivors of sexual assault, as well as their friends, family members, and significant others, because we know that they may be impacted as well, too. All of those counseling services are free to all clients, and we start serving them at the age of 13. They can be a male or a female. We also understand that transporta transportation is an issue. So we do offer free transportation to all victims of sexual violence who live within the Somerset County. We do run support groups to men and women um, when they're available. We do have advocacy services that are trained volunteer confidential sexual violence advocates that go through a 40-hour training, which we do provide at the Sexual Assault Support Services at Zoo for Health. They will answer the hotlines, accompany victims at the police station if they decide to report, as well as accompany victims at the hospital if they decide to have what we call a rape kit done. We do do community education and prevention. Within um, SAS, I am the prevention and outreach coordinator, so a lot of my work is done within middle schools and high schools when it comes to prevention, but outreach we do amongst the larger community. When we do activate a SART, which is a sexual assault response team, it's made out of three members, which would be law enforcement, SANE, which is the sexual assault nurse examiner, as well as an advocate, and we provide the advocates. So here is some community outreach and education that we do. So we'll do a curriculum called Safe Dates, which is usually done within the middle school and high schools, and we primarily talk about healthy relationships, dating, um, and boundaries. We'll do a 45-minute presentation on healthy relationships. We'll dive into talking about consent, usually with our freshmen and our middle school students. 
And then we do a presentation called In Her Shoes, which allows um, our senior students to kind of dive into what it feels like to be a victim of sexual assault and or domestic violence, understand some of um, the impacts when someone is a victim of sexual assault, and also kind of see how they navigate that entire system. We also do mandatory reporting and consent law trainings for law enforcement, as well as school counselors and specialized topics, as well as to things like sexting and sexual harassment. Okay. When we show up for um, advocacy, whether that's through the hotline, when we accompany the victim at the hospital or the police station, here is what we do, and this is a little bit more on our role. We provide victims with information about all of their options. So it's kind of like laying out all of the cards and allowing them to choose what's best for them. We provide trauma-specific services. We work with the victim to develop an action plan. We listen and believe the victim. Neither we don't investigate, nor do we judge the victim at all. And we practice teamwork. We support survivors in whatever they need for their support. We normalize their reactions to trauma. We understand that everyone isn't going to react the same way. Some people may be silent. They may not want to talk at all. Some people may cry. Some people may be in shock and don't really understand what has happened to them. We help them prioritize and solve concerns. We ensure that they are treated respectfully. We support their significant others as well, too. Sometimes there may be someone that shows up at the hospital or the police station when they report. That may be a friend or family member and may not understand their needs, and we also explain that to them. We provide crisis education, referrals, and a follow-up. So how to support a victim or a survivor? Sometimes we may not be the first person that that victim reaches out to, and it may be a friend or a family member. So you want to empathize, you want to educate, and you want to empower. Here's what it looks like. So when you have empathy, you can say things like, I understand that you are feeling afraid right now. When you want to educate, you can let them know that that's a common response following a sexual assault. And also when you want to empower, it took a lot of courage to call the hotline today and to seek support. Sexual assault is the only crime in which consent and the degree of resistance are issues. In most other crimes, no one asks, what were you wearing? Why did you go there? Why did you get in a car? Why did you leave your window open? Did you scream, yell, fight back? Were you drinking or using drugs? Did you know the person? Are you sure what's happened? And I put this out there just so you can understand why it's so important to kind of, not kind of, to actually support a victim when they do tell you or they do disclose to you that they were a victim or they had some type of experience where they did not give consent. And I have a little story to tell you just to kind of put it into perspective. A man walks into a bank and slides a note to a bank teller that says, give me all of your money or else. The teller cooperates with him by giving him all the money in her drawer. Even though there is no visible weapon and no verbal threats have been spoken, does this mean that the teller slash bank wasn't robbed? Does this mean that the teller conspired with the bank robber to rob the bank? These are some things that sexual assault victims may go through. It may not be something violent that happened. It could have been coercion that was used. They were pressured into doing so, usually when a sexual assault takes place. It doesn't always have to be a weapon used. It's more than likely when a sexual assault occurs, it will be by someone that that person knows, whether it's a friend, family member, and or significant other. So this is why it's so crucial to convey these three things when talking with anyone who's disclosing a sexual assault. Start off with saying that I believe you. Start off with saying you are, you are, it's not your fault and you are not alone. Here is my contact info uh, where we're located. So if you guys have any questions, please follow up with me. Also in the back, we do have brochures. We have some highlighters and some pens as well too with our hotline number one there. Thank you. <laughs> I am going to pass this along to Sharon. Hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. I love talking about our program and the services that we provide. 
So I'm just going to take a second to start my timer because I can go easily over the 10 minutes. I have a dual role uh, in my job. I am the SART coordinator and the forensic nurse examiner for Somerset County and my office is located at the prosecutor's office in Somerville. First, I'm going to talk about our SART program. Um, it is a statewide program, so there is somebody like me, a SART coordinator and a forensic nurse examiner coordinator in every county in the state. We work under the Attorney General guidelines for both programs. The goals of the SART program are to provide victim-centered care. I think you've heard a couple people mention victim-centered care previously. And what that means is we try not to re-victimize the, um, the, I'll call them a patient because I'm a nurse. So um, that means that uh, throughout the entire process, once somebody chooses to come forward, they have many choices. The components of the SART team are the conf confidential uh, rape care advocate that comes from our Zoo Falls Center in Somerville. The other is a forensic nurse examiner, and then there's law enforcement. So during this process, um, the victim has choices. They can ask for all three members of the SART, or they can request uh, any, any portion of the SART team, which would be a law enforcement and a nurse, just a nurse and an advocate. Sorry about that. I like to wander. I don't know about all this. Is this working? Yes, it is. So um, they can have any portion of the SART team that they would like to have, and they can also uh, change their mind during the process. Just because they choose um, only a nurse in the beginning doesn't mean that they can't change their mind and want law enforcement involved or an advocate uh, as we go through the process. So qualifications um, to activate SART are you uh, need to be at least 13 years of age or older and the assault needed to occur within the last five days. Anybody have an idea why the five days is important? number and why we don't do it, why we didn't cap it at three days or ten days. It would have to do with the degradation of um, the specimens that we take and the evidence. So again, it's within five days or 13 years and older. And that's to see the nurse. If you want to come forward and report a sexual assault, you can do so without, outside of the five days you are still entitled to speak with an advocate and you can certainly talk to law enforcement um, outside of that five days. And our best thing, our services are free. All the services provided um, at the hospital by the forensic nurse examiners are free, including medications. Um, anything that has to do with the sexual assault while you're there are free services. And I think that's really important because money um, and a lack of insurance can be a deterrent for anybody to want to come forward to a hospital and possibly generate a bill because we know they can go into the thousands of dollars. So um, I do a whole other uh, topic of uh, barriers to reporting and why people don't come forward and that's uh, a very important one for me because I have been without insurance and I would not want to be in that situation. So how do you get these services, the SART services? Uh, I'm from Somerset County. In our county, uh, probably it's the same in Hunter, and we, you can um, go to your local police department, file a report. They know how to activate the rest of the chain. Um, you can call the sexual assault hotline that Ariana said is taken care of by our um, sexual violence advocates, or you can just show up to the hospital. In Hunter and County and in Somerset County, uh, both counties have one facility. It's Hunter and Medical Center in Hunter and County and Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital slash Somerset in Somerset County. So it's a pretty uh, simple thing once you've made the decision and all of those um, entities will know how to uh, handle your uh, requests in getting the members of the SART. 
Perfect. Okay, so a forensic nurse examiner. Sometimes uh, we're referred to as sexual assault nurse examiners, but actually what we are, are we're registered nurses who have received um, pretty extensive training in forensic nursing. So we're actually forensic nurses certified in sexual assault, and we are given a um, an addendum license to our regular nursing licenses that make us forensic nurses. So when you go to the hospital, you choose to have an exam. In the state of New Jersey, 99% of the time, that is who you're going to see no matter which county you are in. You will see a forensic nurse examiner at your hospital or if they have a standalone facility. In Somerset County, I have a team of nurses we cover um, a schedule, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including holidays. So any time that you uh, experience a sexual assault, you have a friend, um, you make your complaint to the hospital, to the hotline, to the police department, they're going to call us and we're going to meet you at the hospital. So again, it's Somerset County, it's Somerset Hospital, Robert Wood Johnson. We have, uh, we're very lucky here in Somerset County. We have a very nice facility in the emergency room at the hospital. Um, all of our victims go there. We have a an kind of an interview room connected to an exam room, and uh, we're just very lucky. It's, um, it's a really nice setup. It's private, and I'm really, I'm, very happy and very proud of the county because not all counties have such a, a nice setup. So when you come to the hospital and you want to see the nurse, we do um, a medical forensic report. It's pretty extensive with some very in-depth questions, very personal questions. And then with the victim's permission, we'll do a forensic exam, which uh, we will collect specimens from the victim because their body is considered evidence and um, again with their permission uh, and we'll do the, the collection by their story of what had happened. That's the, the rape kit. The rape kit is then passed on a chain of custody to law enforcement and it is held until uh, it's, the decision is made to test the kit. We also have a five-year hold policy in the state of New Jersey where you can, uh, we call it a, a five-year hold, it's like a Jane Doe, you can come forward anonymously to everyone but the people that you um, ask from the SART team. Your information does not go on the outside of the rape kit and it can be held for up to five years until the victim decides that yes, they would like to go forward uh, with the police. So in that case, you would not have police involvement. Also at the hospital, the victim has the option. Uh, medications can be ordered if appropriate. Medications being morning after pill, antibiotics, HIV medication, if appropriate to the situation. Um, again, those are offered by the hospital free of charge. Um, not every service is offered with every victim. It's really kind of a fluid situation depending on the victim's situation. Um, did anybody have any questions? Oh, Sharon, I didn't, you know, I had that on the top of the page. Introduction, right? My name is Sharon Williams. I've been with the program for a little more than six years as the coordinator, and um, I love what I do. So please, if you have any questions afterwards, and I'd like to encourage everybody, we have brochures and information about all the programs that were um, talked about here today on the tables in the back. Thank you. Hi everyone, welcome for coming today. My name is Gina Kylers. I'm a licensed professional counselor, clinically certified forensic counselor. I'm the full-time uh, lead mental health counselor here at RV. And one of the things that I do here is not just the counseling services, but I help support the students from beginning to end on what's going on. If we have someone um, who reports that they have been sexually assaulted, um, whether it was you know that day, that night, the, what, the following day, or the 
previous day, I should say, I will go with that person and report it to our security office and go with them the, the whole way. Um, I will go with that person to the police department and not be in the room when they do the investigative um, interviews, but I will be waiting for them right outside so that they know that they have someone right there for them. I will help connect them with the support services um, that they're going to need that can specialize in what they really need for them. Um, while here, I am their go-to person. If they're having a moment where they just need to take a break and take a step away, they can come over to my office no matter what time it is. If I'm seeing someone, I'll wrap that person up and I'll bring that other student in. So that's a good thing that we have. One thing that we are rolling out this year, um, it's a soft roll for this first semester, and then next year we're really going to be bringing it out um, more uh, wide known, is what's called STAMP. It's a new club on campus, um, and it's students teaching and mentoring peers. These students have been trained in peer education, and we are getting them trained with mental health first aid. Um, what we want to do is have an additional support on campus for our students here, for our community. And one of those things is that they're not just doing education workshops, but they're doing, we're having a buddy system. So let's say someone is dealing with someone who maybe has been harassing them and we know about it and we have the supports put in place, but they're still unsure, they're still kind of worried about what's going on. I can pair that person up with someone who could be their buddy and walk around. Maybe they need someone to walk them to their cars at nighttime. Not only will our security staff do it, but our buddy system can be there for that person as well. And it's an additional support that we're really trying to help make sure our students here at RV um, know that is, it's there. And it's not just for anybody who's been sexually assaulted or harassed or is going through stalking. It's for anybody on campus dealing with maybe a depression or anxiety or anything like that. Um, my office is right up in advising and counseling, and I'm here Monday through Friday, 8.30 to uh, 4.30, and later, depending on what's going on for that day. So I will be available if anyone has any questions. Um, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Jason Fredericks. I serve as uh, Dean of Student Affairs here at the college. Um, I also serve as the Deputy Title IX Coordinator and um, Title IX Investigator for the college. Um, we have our actual uh, Title IX uh, Coordinator and Administrator here, Cheryl Wallace, as well. Um, when it comes to um, issues of sexual assault on campus and sexual and uh, domestic violence, what we're normally seeing in a community college differs slightly from what we see at other colleges. Um, we are not residential. So within the community so college sector, what we're often seeing are students that have had um, these traumatic experiences happen up to in high school. Um, and these issues are now coming here on our campus. Often we have situations where um, assaults have taken place while students were in high school. Um, things were set in place there, but as they now come onto campus, we're in the Valley is a fairly small campus, we're going to start seeing many of those students coming in contact with each other. Um, so one of the larger issues that we have are really trying to create a supportive environment for all of those students. One of the key things that guide our process within higher ed in general um, is Title IX. And you will hear that word thrown around a lot, but it, is, it really comes into play when it comes to access to education and anything that may get in a person's way uh, when it comes to accessing education. So any school that receives federal funds um, is bound to provide these particular services. And so all in all, when any issue comes to our office, we take it extremely seriously. Um, any student that comes to our office, even if they decide not to file a police report, the college will be putting things in place to help support that student.
So in some of our cases, we have issues that have happened well beyond the time when those students were on our campus. Um, but we can do a multiple, multiple things. There are things such as a referral to inside and outside agencies. Um, sometimes we have situations where we can change class schedules, where we can step in the middle and negotiate um, a variety of services and situations that just all help to allow a student to be able to continue their time here at Raritan Valley. And that is kind of one of the key things that we do. Um, along with actual adjudication of cases and working out uh, those various arrangements, we also provide a series of support systems, educational tools for outreach and uh, prevention of sexual violence. Uh, so we have things such as an online educational tool. We're doing constantly programs um, throughout the college, working with advising and counseling, the first year office, and student life to produce programming so students are aware. Uh, bystander interventions is one of the key things as well. We are aware of the role that bystanders can play um, regarding the prevention of sexual assault um, and sexual violence. So we are stepping in there as well, ensuring that students are um, are aware of, the, of this very serious issue. When it comes to the adjudication of the, um, things within the, college, uh, within the college setting, there is really a dual process. There are crimes and those are handled by law enforcement, but there are also all those violations of college policy. Um, and college policy, of course, covers sexual assault, uh, sexual harassment, stalking, domestic violence, and we have very clear and serious uh, policies regarding um, those issues, and those are the things that we can often assist students with um, and step in either through formal adjudication or through other means to make sure that um, a student's environment is safe and protected. Um, we, I have brochures in the back there um, for anyone who's interested in some of the sexual and domestic violence resources. Um, our office is located in the first floor of College Center, and we're always available to assist. Thank you very much. Um, that'll conclude our program. I want to again thank Raritan Valley for allowing us to host here. The Hunterdon County Prosecutor's Office, my office, Somerset County Prosecutor's Office, and those that attended. Um, look, I know this is a sensitive topic, as are many topics um, that we deal with in our prosecutor's offices, but I really want to encourage you, you know, kind of following up on what the general said about having a dialogue and making sure that you're a part of that dialogue because we can't do our jobs effectively without your input. Um, and so if anyone has any questions, you know, you have an arsenal of people with a vast amount of knowledge to answer them. Um, if you're not comfortable and want to kind of, quote, ask them offline, I'm sure these folks will be willing to, to stick around. And I would even extend those questions if you have any questions about careers. You know, we do a lot of stuff here at this university um, related to the criminal law field. And um, as you can see from all the examples, it's not just men and women in uniforms carrying a gun and wearing a badge. There's a whole host of other things in the law enforcement community that you can do. You know, victim witness, again, I come back to them. They are a vital, vital part of any successful prosecutor's office, um, as is all the other collaboration that we do with Zoofall and Safe and Sound. We have Safe and Sound in Somerset County. So those are partnerships and folks that we work with um, to help support the community when, unfortunately, they may deal with a, a, an event. So again, with that, um, if anyone does have any questions, we'll take them. And otherwise, um, again, we'll stick around if you just want to ask us something offline. So thank you. No? It only takes one, and then it's like a domino effect. And you... <laughs> it's all right. All right, well, we'll stick around if anyone wants to. Ask us. Thank you, guys.